Who's in the audience today? How many people here are for their 50th reunion or higher? Yay! I just had my 50th reunion at Cornell last year, so I know. 25th to 49th reunion? Yeah. Okay. First to 25th? Oh, we have a good sampling here. How many of you are grandparents? Okay. How many of you are empty nesters, people who just sent their kids to college? And parents with kids at home? Oh, how'd you get away? <laughs> <laughs> Folks without kids? Okay, we have some of everybody. All right. It's very fitting that we talk on this topic today because this very month is the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's first Commission on the Status of Women report, October 1963. And Eleanor Roosevelt was the chair of that commission. She died, unfortunately, a year before the commission reported. But um, they laid out the agenda. And we are going to be comparing today the situation from 1960 uh, to today. So. Um, we're celebrating the anniversary in a most appropriate way. The changes in gender roles are some of the most revolutionary changes of our time. When I first started the Center for Research on Women at Stanford in 1974, one of our first speakers was Herbert Marcuse, a philosopher that some of you may remember. And he said in his talk that he thought that the change in gender roles that was already in progress in 1974, was the single most revolutionary um, set of changes uh, that he knew about, and he thought it was going to become more revolutionary. Well, I think the civil rights movement has also been revolutionary, and we can think of some others. But there's no doubt that the gender revolution has been extraordinary. I don't have time to talk about all the changes today. And if I've missed one that you particularly care about, I hope that you'll ask questions uh, when we have Q&A uh, at the end. The major changes I'm going to talk about are first the increase in women's labor force participation, the decrease in the pay gap between women and men, the decrease in occupational segregation, by which I mean the kinds of jobs that men do and the kinds of jobs that women do, and the increase in women's leadership positions. And then I'm going to ask the question, has the revolution stalled? A lot of highly educated women are unable to combine career and family, and they leave the workforce. We're going to talk about that. There's still a dearth of women in leadership positions. And there's still a dearth of women in the so-called STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. So let's look at the changes. The first change is the increase in women's labor force participation. This change is nothing but extraordinary. 1968, 1960, 38% of women were in the workforce. This is women over the age of 16 all the way up until the ones who are still living. <laughs> That's the entire adult population. 38% were in the workforce uh, in 1960. And you know how we get these numbers. The Labor Department sends a surveyor to ask about labor force behavior. Uh, first question is, did you work for pay last week? Um, second question is, if you didn't work for pay, were you looking for work? Nobody pays too much attention to exactly how well you were looking for work, but if you were looking for work, you're considered unemployed, but you're part of the labor force. Third possibility, you're not in the labor force. Either you're studying, or you're a homemaker, or you're uh, taking long walks, or you... Um, are lazy or whatever. This is also, this is the non-institutional population. So we're not talking about people who couldn't be working because they're hospitalized or in prison. By 2010, we're up to 58% of women in the workforce. 20 percentage points in 50 years. But the labor force participation for married mothers changed even more. 
1960, moms with kids 6 to 17, just about 40%. Today, 76%, almost double. 1960, moms with kids under 6. This was rare in 1960, less than 20%. Today, mom with, moms with kids under 6, almost two-thirds of moms with kids under 6 are in the workforce. Interestingly, during this same period of time, the participation rates for men declined. How many of you already knew that? Yeah, because you're married to me. <laughs> 10 percentage point decline for men. Why? Because more men are in college. So it used to be that men between the ages of 18 and 25 were in the workforce. Now more of them are in college. And Many more men are retired today, thanks to Social Security, thanks to pension plans, uh, as compared to 1960. But as you all know from listening to the news, uh, this may be changing. So we will uh, come back to that. All right. Why did women's labor force participation increase? Uh, these uh, reasons are the ones that are usually given. And we'll talk about each of them. Increase in women's education, decline in the birth rate, the pull of the labor market, changes in families' income aspirations, the so-called snowball effect, which means that your neighbors all went to work and now the block was lonely, so you're going to work too, um, and labor-saving devices with two big question marks after it. And I put the two big question marks there because the research on labor-saving devices is actually quite interesting. Um, it turns out that even though, of course, we had many labor-saving devices, uh, they didn't really save time, or people found new ways to spend their time if they were homemakers. So for example, you would think that the washing machine and dryer would have saved time, but it didn't. Why not? Wash more things. People did more laundry. Now your kids throw their jeans in every day, whereas you used to wash jeans, you know, once a month. Um, so the same thing happened with, um, um, you know, permanent press fabrics. You would think ironing um, would be labor saving now, but people have more clothes. So you have more laundry than you had before, and on and on. Also, chauffeuring now takes up all the slack. <laughs> so if there was any time saved on any of these things, now parents are chauffeuring their kids all over uh, because of what we'll call in a minute intense, more intensive parenting, which includes uh, taking your kids to all sorts of lessons uh, seven days a week. So it's not clear that women into the, went into the workforce because they had no more work to do at home. Rather, it looks like women uh, picked up a double shift. They went into the workforce, and they continued to do much of the work they did before, although it's also true if you look more recently at the data that, it, that houses are probably dirtier than they used to be because vacuuming definitely has gone down in terms of numbers of hours uh, spent. Okay, but the increase in education is far and away the most important factor here. Because women with college education, and men too, but you no, know, the changes for women, develop what economists like to call a taste for work. Um, and they have a higher opportunity cost of staying home. Because if they have a college education, the earnings in the labor market that they can receive are higher than they were before. And so if they don't go into the labor force, they're losing a lot more in income than they would if they were not college graduates. And the taste for work is interesting and complicated. It just means that people get excited about issues in college, and they want to spend time uh, in their workplace um, dealing with those issues, one way or the other, either becoming um, a business person, or becoming a professional, or um, uh, simply uh, using the skills they develop in college. So in 1970, it was very rare 
for a woman to be a college graduate. 9% of women were college graduates in 1970. By 2010, 40% of women are college graduates. And if you look at the slide, now women and men, 40% um, for both, 39% for both. And it may be that women will outpace men because uh, the percentage of women in college now is actually a little bit higher than the percentage of men. So um, this has been a tremendous revolution uh, in the college graduation rates for men and for women. At the same time, birth rates have declined. And women with fewer children are better able to combine work with having a family. So 1960, 24 per thousand women was the birth rate. And now it's down to 13.8 per thousand women. So that decline, um, both in number of children and the percentage of women who have no children at all, has meant an increase in the possibility of, uh, of work. Why have birth rates fallen? So now we begin to see that this is all very complex because <laughs> it's not like we can paint a picture where birth rates fall, education increases, and the labor force increases. All of these things are happening all at once. So the increased education of women causes a decrease in the birth rate. This is not true just for the United States. This is true worldwide. The best family planning uh, <laughs> available is to send women to higher education, because then they decrease their own birth rates. And, um, Increased labor force participation of women also decreases the birth rate. Because if you um, are participating in the workforce, enjoying your job, trying to balance work and family, you may decide not to have the second child and certainly may decide not to have the third child. So that has an effect. Lower infant mortality, that's very important. I mean, if you don't know how many of your children are going to live, you may well want to have a goodly number, uh, whereas if you can be pretty sure that the children you do have will live, uh, you have an entirely different situation. Decreased economic need for children. So it used to be, in, particularly in agricultural uh, uh, societies, that parents needed their children. When they were too old to farm, they needed their children for, to farm, especially their sons. So you wanted to make sure you had at least a few sons who would survive to adulthood and um, run your farm. Uh, that, that is not what's happening today. You know, uh, parents are not, by and large, uh, although this may change with the, <laughs> with the Great Recession, but parents, by and large, are not relying on their children um, for pro providing for them uh, in their older age. And then we have the increased cost of children. So what's happened is that we have fewer children, we parent them more intensively, and they all cost more than they used to. Particularly for college, I mean, no, the, the number that's bandied about now is uh, for a private school um, for one child for four years, we're talking about uh, $200,000. So you may well think about having the third child if that's what, uh, you're thinking about. So the increased cost of children also causes the birth rate to fall. All right, now divorce rates have increased the labor force participation rate because divorced women, as you might expect, have a much higher labor force participation rate than married women. So in 1960, divorce was, fair, was rare. 9.2 per thousand married women. In 1980, which was the peak year for divorces, I'm proud to say I got divorced in that year too. Um, in 2007, uh, we're down. And the rate has flattened out. It's a, so I don't feel too badly about 2007, although I couldn't find more recent statistics. And I think maybe because the government websites were shut down, but maybe because um, the government isn't collecting statistics on divorces anymore. So 17 per 1,000 married women. Um, divorce rates for first, second, and third marriages. Um, 
Lifetime probability of divorce in first marriages somewhere between 35 and 50. Well, that's a pretty broad range. Um, and the reason is that it depends on what, what figure you push forward. You know, you have, to, you have to estimate for somebody getting married today, what's the probability of getting divorced in the future? Well, do you think the divorce rates will stay as they are? Do you think they'll decline? They're lower, way lower for college graduates, partly because they get married later and partly because, well, we hope they've learned something in college about how to pick a mate, maybe. <laughs> um, probability of divorce in second marriages, somewhere between 60 and 67 percent, and third marriages, even higher. So you might think people would learn uh, as they go along, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Now, um, you have to be careful with divorce statistics. Uh, what you don't want to do is count the number of marriages in any year, count the number of divorces, and divide one by the other and see what the divorce rate is, because you know, that's really not the right way to look at this. And you have to be careful just looking at the percentage of the population that gets divorced, which is another kind of divorce rate that's around, which I call the crude divorce rate which is wrong because you know, the population increases or decreases for lots of reasons, and then that changes the crude divorce rate, so that doesn't really make sense. So this divorce rate that I gave you is probably the best one to look at. It's about 17 per 1,000 married women for, for first marriage. Oh, no, for overall, for overall marriages. OK. Interestingly, the percent of the population that is married has declined. So in 1960, 70% of the adult population was married. Um, in 2010, it was only 50%. But 72% of people were once married or now married. So it's interesting if you think about what is the norm in our society. The norm is to get married. We are the most married society. European students in my class always are amazed at how much their American girlfriends or boyfriends want to get married because Europeans are not getting married. Um, I mean, they're still having children and they're still cohabiting, but they're not getting married. Americans like to get married. We have the highest marriage rate. We also have the highest divorce rate. So, you know, um, it's the triumph. What is it? The triumph of hope over um, experience. Uh, so we are a marrying society. But um, the fact is, at any point in time, Half the population is not living um, in a married couple. They may be cohabiting, but they're not living in a married couple. All right, the age at first marriage has increased. Um, we went from uh, 23 for men and 20 for women in 1960, um, up to 28 and, uh, for men and 26 for women. And unmarried women have a higher labor force participation rate. So this also increases uh, the labor force participation rate. OK, the second big change I want to talk about is the reduction in the gender pay gap. In 1960, for full-time year-round workers, it was about 61 cents on the dollar. Um, and you know what we used to talk about was 59 cents on the dollar, because if you didn't um, <clears throat> control for full time and year round, it was about 59 cents on the dollar. Now it's up to about 83% uh, the pay gap. So that's really um, a big change. But there's now a motherhood penalty. So as compared to working women without children, the average working mom loses 5% for every child, after controlling for all the other factors. And for those under 35, the motherhood penalty, that is if you compare women with no children with women with children, the motherhood penalty is greater than the penalty, uh, the pay gap between men and women. Basically, women with no children who are under 35 are earning approximately what their male colleagues are earning. The new problem is motherhood. <laughs> it's not gender. Women who can, you know, 
as Sheryl Sandberg puts it, lean in all the way, um, are doing OK. So that's very different from the way it was in 1960. Why has the gender pay gap narrowed? Three main reasons. Changes in women's jobs, increases in women's work experience, because work experience makes you more productive, hopefully, and it also gives you the opportunity to be promoted and earn higher wages, <clears throat> and decreases in men's earnings. So part of the reason the pay gap has declined is that men have lost good jobs in the manufacturing sector and have moved instead into jobs that don't pay as high wages. So men's wages are going down, average men's wages, at the same time that women's wages are going up. So the good news is that women's wages are going up. <clears throat> the not so good news is that men's wages are going down. Demographers and social scientists like to study occupational segregation by computing what they call the index of dissimilarity, which is the percentage of men or women who would have to change their occupation in order for there to be the same distribution across occupations between women and men. This is not an easy thing to think about. <laughs> But you can see that in 1970, 68% of women would have had to change their jobs in order for there to be this parity. And 2010, only about half. So that's a measure of the improvement in the parity between men's and women's jobs. What's happened, as many of you know, is that women have entered the high-paying professions. In 1970, women were 5% of all lawyers and 10% of all doctors. By 2010, they were one-third of lawyers and 30% of doctors. And women MBA recipients. When I came to Stanford in 1972, I was the first woman ever to teach at the business school. There were five women MBA students in my class. Five total out of a class of 350. Now, Lily came shortly thereafter. <laughs> and she can tell you that she, things were beginning to change already by 1976. But you didn't get Yeah. So, the business school at Stanford was found in the mid early 1920s. And if you look back at the list of students, all the way back to 1922, 23, there were never more than five women students in any of the classes. And now, a little more than a third of MBA recipients are women, not only at Stanford, but across the country. So this is an enormous change. And I personally witnessed that change, as did Lily. And when I first came to Stanford, the dean was R.J. Miller. And um, all his associates were telling him that the business school needed to graduate more women because we had affirmative action programs. And all these businessmen were being asked to hire women managers. And they couldn't find any, because there were none. So R.J. thought, yes, we should. Uh, increase the percentage of women, and he asked if I would help recruit. So for one year, I recruited women. And I never had to recruit after that, because as soon as the word got out that Stanford and Harvard and every place else was looking for MBA candidates, the women didn't need recruiting. They applied. And they've been applying ever since, and although um, the rates are not up to the rates in medical schools and law schools, which are now 50%. Um, they are somewhere, I don't know, 36, 38%. So that's an enormous change. On the other hand, I keep saying, but, but, 1970, the percentage of women in the construction trades, 1%. Now you could say there's been a doubling. <laughs> um, we're up to 2%. 
but basically no change at that part. And construction jobs are very good jobs, as you know, for people who are not college graduates. $25 an hour, um, but women are not in those jobs. And we can talk more in the Q&A about why not, but they're not. OK, has the revolution stalled? Highly educated women are dropping out of the workforce. <clears throat> if you look at the national statistics, um, the two groups of women who are least likely to be in the workforce are the ones with highest family income and the ones with lowest family income. The ones with lowest family income, it doesn't pay for them to be in the workforce because the cost of childcare for them is higher than what they're going to earn in the workforce. The ones whose family incomes are very high are able to uh, make it on one salary. And many of them drop out. Now, some of them drop out because their husbands have what I call killer careers. And it's impossible for them to be in the workforce um, unless they get a third parent into the picture. Uh, you know, you can't have two people traveling all over the world at a moment's notice without somebody there, a nanny, a grandparent, um, a sister, somebody, a brother, uh, to pick up the slack. So we are losing a lot of highly educated women. 40% um, of mothers whose husbands were in the top 5% of the income distribution were out of the workforce. Uh, if you look at studies of alumni at elite institutions, uh, I mean, we, we, we're reliant on places that do studies because there are no national data on, uh, on, on you folks. <laughs> in 2000, among Yale alumni in their 40s, 90% of the men, but only 56% of the women were employed. And the statistics for Harvard and Harvard Business School are similar. I did a study with a graduate student of mine, Agnes Chan. Um, we studied both the graduates of Stanford and the graduates of Tokyo University, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A if you want. But in our study of Stanford, uh, 10 years after graduation for the class of 1980, that is, we surveyed them in 1990, 88% of the men were employed full time, but only two thirds of the women. And 12% of the women were full-time homemakers. So of course, we asked, um, if you left the labor force, why did you leave the labor force? You have a Stanford degree. Um, <coughs> excuse me, why did you leave the labor force? And we got the same answer across the board. I tried. I really tried. And I failed. I failed to be able to get enough flexibility in my job to allow me to work while I had kids. And so I will come to this. It, it, we have got to change the workplaces if we're going to make use of the highly educated women we have. <clears throat> we have a choice rhetoric in our society. We believe people should have free choices. And I certainly think we should not force anybody to work uh, if they're a parent and they can manage uh, without working. But it is a waste of resources. Um, first of all, it's a waste of resources for the individual because given the labor markets today, it's very difficult to return to work. If you've dropped out in most instances uh, to raise children for five to 10 years, you're going to have difficulty coming back. And again, we can talk about that. Because I think if you have to drop out, there are some strategies you ought to be using to make sure you can get back in, like keeping up your networks and uh, keeping your fingers in the pie. Uh, but it's very difficult to return on a personal level. On a societal level, there are costs too. So yes, it's your personal choice. And I always tell students, you know, don't denigrate people who make different choices from yours because you don't know their whole story. You don't know why they've left the workforce. Maybe they have a special needs child and they don't feel like telling you about it. So, you know, keep your judgments low. But 
when you make a choice to leave the workforce, you are providing one fewer model for younger women. My husband is here, Jay Jackman. We did some consulting um, for companies that had lost their senior women, and they wanted us to come in because not only did they lost their senior women, but because they lost their senior women, they couldn't get junior women. The junior women looked around, potential junior women, and said, I don't see any senior women here. This doesn't look like a good place for me. So um, fewer role models um, mean that it's difficult for younger women to uh, aspire. And there are fewer sponsors for women. All the research shows that women in leadership positions are more likely to hire and promote women than men are. So it's a cost when women drop out of the workforce. All right, let's look at leadership. There's good news and bad news. 1961 to 63 in the Senate, 2% of the senators were women, 4% of the representatives. Now we've got 20 women in the Senate, so 20% of the Senate is women and 20% uh, of the House of Representatives. So what should we say about this? Well, it's an improvement. There was nowhere to go but up. Uh, but if you look at these figures and compare them to other countries, we're not doing well at all. And many of those countries that have high percentages of women in the legislatures actually have quotas, which I don't think is a solution that's going to have any traction here in this country. But um, we, we could aspire. And there is an organization now that's trying very hard to try to have um, um, 20, uh, what is it? 20% of the House of Representatives, no, 50% of the House of Representatives by, by 2020. So that's a good goal. Corporate leadership positions. Uh, I couldn't even find data on uh, what was happening here in 1960. I, I don't think it was collected. Um, Fortune 500 companies, 4.2%. Fortune 1,000, 4.5%. Interesting that there's not much difference there. Uh, women on corporate boards, 12%. Uh, this is the organization that's trying to have 20% uh, of uh, women on corporate boards by 2020. Other leadership positions. In law, one of my former students, Anne, is here, <laughs> who's gone into law. 45% of associates in law firms are women, but only 15% of partners. So what's happening there? Well, most of us know what's happening there. Nothing good. Full professors of science in universities, 2010, 16%. STEM fields. Women hold 24% of jobs in STEM fields, although they're 50% of the labor force as a whole and only 13% of jobs in engineering. President Obama talked about this recently, and what he said was, if we're going to be the leaders internationally of <coughs> science and technology, as he put it, we have to have all hands on deck. So this is a big problem. Why are women underrepresented? Well, there are basically two sets of reasons. The first two on this slide are what I call, as an economist, supply-side explanations. They have to do with the women themselves. And the other one is the demand-side explanation, which has to do with the organizations, work organizations, the structures and the uh, cultures in those organizations. So Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, which has had a lot of publicity, and I recommend it to you. It's a very interesting book. Um, she concentrates on the supply side, the failure to lean in. Now, what we used to call this when I first started out in this business was we needed assertiveness training for women. Women needed to be more assertive. So we trained them to be more assertive, and then what happened to them? You know, you can be very assertive, and if there's no, nothing on the other side that's taking it in, you just bang your head against the wall, or in this case, against the glass ceiling. So, you know, you have to, Alfred Marshall, the great economist of the 19th century, said that any market 
has supply and demand, and it's like a scissors. You can't cut with one blade of the scissors. You need two blades. You need supply changes, you need demand changes. You need women to be more ambitious, but you also need work organizations that will be flexible so that women can um, thrive in them. And then part of the failure to lean in is women's uh, caretaking responsibilities. And I put responsibilities in quotes because, of course, it isn't just women's responsibilities to take care of children. Um, it's father's responsibilities as well. And so you get the mommy penalty because um, families uh, are putting all the responsibilities on women. Okay, now another problem, as I alluded to earlier, is that parenting has become more intensive. So these numbers are interesting. The number of hours per week teaching, playing with, and caring for children. Uh, married mothers, 1965, about 11 hours. By 2011, uh, 13 and a half hours. Married fathers, uh, almost three hours in 1965. Um, you know, a tripling here. Uh, more than triple in, in 2011. So the total uh, for fathers and mothers went from 13.2 to 20.8, .5, up about 58%. And I witnessed this phenomenon personally. I have a granddaughter who's now um, 15. When she was first born, I came to visit my son and daughter-in-law. And um, my room was right next to my granddaughter's. So she was waking me up at 6 o'clock anyway. And I volunteered to give her a bottle the following morning so my son and daughter-in-law could sleep in. And my son said to me, that's great. What will you do with her after you give her the bottle? <laughs> and I said, do with her? Uh, by then it will be about 6.15 AM. Um, I think I'll put her back in her crib um, and I'll go back to sleep. Oh, he said, you can't do that. I said, why? He said, well, you have to play with her. I said, at 6 a.m., I'm going to play with her. He said, oh, yeah, we play with her in the morning at 6 a.m. That's the intensive parenting here. Uh, I declined. I said they could feed her. <laughs> All right, what's required for further progress? More equal distribution of housework and parenting, redesigning of work for women and men, harmonizing work and school schedules, paid parental leave, and creation of a quality child care system. President Nixon vetoed a child care system in 1971. He said it would weaken the family, and we haven't had it up for revote since 1971. Nobody's talking about a quality child care system. Um, I recommend the book Getting to 5050, which was written by my daughter-in-law, Joanna Strober and Sharon Mears um, about how to get to 50-50. Nobody's at 50-50, but everybody's trying to get to 50-50. Uh, redesigning work for women and men. This is the major project of the Clayman Institute at Stanford now, is studying how to do this. How to change the culture of FaceTime, where people have to be at work. Nobody wants to leave before the boss leaves. Um, and people uh, are stuck, can't go home, have dinner with their children because they have to put in FaceTime. Traveling, you know, you have to travel tomorrow morning, suddenly. Less travel, more video conferencing. Timing of meetings, even at Stanford. People used to create meetings that start at 5.30 in the afternoon. Well, if you're trying to be home for your kid's dinner, that's very difficult. Uh, now I'd be home for your kid's dinner. Make your kid's dinner and be home for your kid's dinner. Uh, and the ability to go off track and come back. This is something that's being pioneered by Deloitte and has been very successful for them. If you want to take a job for a few years that's less demanding while your kids are young and then come back onto the track, you can do it at Deloitte. You can't do it at most places. Recognize that workers are parents. Schools still want to believe that the only function of schools is to educate kids. Hopefully it is the best, most important function of schools, but schools also serve to care for children while their parents are working. So you would think 
that summer vacations and school holidays and so on would coincide with parents' schedules, but they don't. We're the only industrialized country that doesn't have paid maternity leave. Only half of women workers receive any pay during maternity leave. We are in the same league as Sierra Leone and Lesotho. It's embarrassing to go to conferences and talk about paid parental leave. Paid parental leave? Uh, we don't even have maternity leave. Sweden pioneered parental leave, uh, paternal leave and found that it took at least 10 years for fathers to be comfortable taking it. So, you know, these, these are major social changes and we are far behind here. Um, there are 11 million preschoolers whose mothers are employed. Childcare is scarce, expensive, and generally of poor quality. You know, all the research on childcare is done on high quality childcare. And it finds that childcare is a positive influence on children. It's very good for children. Well, that's great. That's good to know, very important to know. But most childcare is not high quality childcare. The National Council for Jewish Women did a study on family daycare, that is, care in other people's homes, um, oh boy, at least 20 years ago. It was scary to read that, that uh, study. So a lot of the child care is poor quality, and we know, with all the brain research that's been done in the last 20 years, how important those first few years are for children, and the fact that we don't have high quality child care is really a sinful. Parents need to work and they can't find child care and they use poor quality care. Uh, I, w I was hoping to talk more about grandparents uh, because that's my status, but uh, we don't have enough time. 85% <laughs> of those born in 1946 are currently grandparents and they have an average of five grandchildren each and grandparents provide 35% of the care for infants and 25% of the care for preschoolers whose moms work. So grandparents are playing an amazing role. And given the changes in life expectancy, um, more kids have grandparents today than ever before. Look at these numbers. In 1940, the average expectancy, life expectancy at birth for men was 61 years. Now you know why Social Security is uh, paying out a lot more than it expected. Uh, women, average expectancy was 65 years. Now, this is at birth. It's higher if you actually reach 65. But for men, it's 76 years, and for women, it's 81 years. So grandparents are playing a much more um, active role in their grandchildren's lives. And somebody thought that maybe grandparents weren't doing such a good job uh, caring for children because they're old and forgetful or whatever the stereotype was. So they did a study <clears throat> to compare the quality of grandparenting uh, for childcare versus other kinds of childcare. And they found that the number of accidents that children have is lowest when grandparents take care of them. <laughs> so. Okay. So the changes in gender roles are not going away. Uh, during the Nixon administration, when there was a uh, downturn in the economy, the recommendation for how to decrease unemployment by the Council of Economic Advisors was to send the women back home. Nobody's saying that anymore. Uh, no, uh, they're saying a lot of other crazy things, but they're not saying that. <laughs> women are half the labor force. But we still haven't fully adapted to the new gender roles. And the task is to assure that everybody can use their skills and talents at work and can also be successful parents. So some of you are in the stage where you're trying to balance work and family. Some of you have children who are trying to balance work and family. Be supportive. Uh, it's really hard. It's hard for them. It's hard for the whole society. And, um, who knows, maybe in another 10 years we'll all be together again and we'll see what's transpired since. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yes? I, I would 
would never say, I, I certainly don't think that, um, you know, incre increasing participation of women in the workforce caused, um, you know, led to a decline in the support for unions. I think there were a lot of other things going on that, that changed both at the same time. Um, that said, to the extent that I think a lot of second wave feminism talks to it, seems to see work as liberation, whereas unions and the labor movement have always been focused on, you know, work can be oppression if you don't have countervailing um, balances. Um, I, I feel like there is there is a tension there, and I guess my, my question is, um, what do you see? What do you see a role of the labor movement in helping to address um, some of these problems? The fact that work isn't structured ideally for parents, especially you know women and men, and I maybe and also I would say for a lot of people, if you don't have some checks and balances on employer power, um, work isn't. Well, first of all, let me say that um, there is research on working class women and their work satisfaction. And it finds that even though uh, we as college graduates might not particularly like doing the jobs that these women do, they like work. They like going to work. They like leaving their homes. They like the status that they get at home, apart from the income, the status from their children, from their husbands. They like um, the sociability at work. They like talking to other um, colleagues. And so you know, we shouldn't walk around thinking that all working class women are in oppressive situations. Uh, they, they like, at least the ones that have been studied, they like to go to work. OK, that said. I think some unions are very strong in pushing for changes in women's roles. I remember years ago talking to a woman who was um, a unionizing um, flight attendants who at that time were primarily, well, they're still primarily female, um, and was having problem within her union because the union included not only flight attendants but also machinists who were almost entirely male. And when, and when it came time to develop a negotiating strategy, uh, the machinists were much more vocal than the flight attendants about what they should be bargaining for. And so, you know, she came to talk to me about, you know, assertiveness training and how she could uh, become more successful. So I think there are a lot of unions that are trying to improve the situation for women. Yes. More and more women are professional women, lawyers, doctors, high income earners you know, are marrying later and having kids late, 35, 40, 42. And because of the situation in the family, the women earn more money than the husband, so the husband stays home. Are there any studies comparing 40, 40 year old first time fathers and parents versus the caregivers or the mothers? So, uh, women versus men caregivers. Okay. So there, there are studies of men as caregivers. Um, and Michael Lamb, the psychologist, has, has done a good number of them. And um, they show that men are perfectly fine caregivers, that men have to start early on um, so that they bond with the baby and the baby bonds with them early on. And you know, there's a lot of literature on how you can do that even though the mother may be nursing, what is the role for the father there? There are very few men still who are full-time at home dads. There are some and there are a whole lot of interesting blogs that those that um, have, uh, who do that, have, because they feel very isolated in their communities. You know, except for New York City and Berkeley, um, most fathers uh, who are full-time caregivers are pretty isolated. But all the literature seems to show that they do a fine job. You know, I have full-time dads come to my class uh, to talk about their role, and almost always, um, after a few years, I have to look for somebody else because they've gone back to work. So they tend to do it for a few years. I have one man who's been a stalwart. He, he comes every year. Uh, but by and large, um, they, they want to go back to work, either for psychological reasons or for economic reasons or for both. Uh, 
just like women. Yes. Well, let, let me say something about that. Let me also say something about the previous question, which I forgot to respond to. Um, <clears throat> women are having babies later, and um, that is partly uh, why the birth rate is low, because if you start having children at 37, um, you know, it's unlikely you're going to have more than one or two. Um, <clears throat> as you all probably know, many women are disappointed um, when they start at 37 and they're infertile. And, um, you know, it's really, um, it's really sad to hear stories of women who really wanted to have children and basically waited too long. So, on the one hand, you want to control fertility, you know, so that you don't have an unwanted child. On the other hand, uh, when you want a child, you may not be able to have the child. So. You know, I had a, a speaker at my class uh, from the medical school a couple of years ago who said there were now 13 ways to become pregnant. <laughs> she didn't go over all 13, but you know, there are so many um, different ways to become pregnant. Um, I'm a little concerned about um, the number of uh, people who so cavalierly say, oh, you know, I'm busy with my career right now, I'm going to freeze my eggs, as though that's the answer. Uh, they forget that that's a very painful process and that, you know, it doesn't always work. Um, and yes, I think controlling your fertility is very important. I heard a lecture recently about the fact that some of the new laws are not just about um, controlling fertility, but that, um, you know, physicians in some places, uh, pediatricians are exempt from um, telling their patients about um, immunizations if they don't want to because the immunizations uh, come about because of research on uh, fetal tissue. And so, you know, it's becoming not only about fertility, but about, you know, our ability to do research on stem cells, our ability to have children immunized uh, because the res research was done on fetal tissue. So, yes, it is worse. I agree. Anne. <laughs> She's not a plant, I promise. <laughs> I see three paths here. One is the individual path. And, you know, that is 
negotiating with your husband who's sitting next to you to, to do more, uh, to have a, a he does. He does, okay. But, um, you know, a lot of people still need negotiating. Um, for those of you who are not in Anne's situation but have children who are in it, being supportive to those children in terms of, um, you know, what you, what you tell your kids. Um, I had a friend who, when she told her mother she was getting a PhD, her mother said, oh, that's terrible. Now you'll have to find a husband who has two PhDs. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's not supportive, right? Um, you, you can be more supportive. So I think on an individual level, you know, being supportive and working toward equality in your own, um, in your own family. Um, on an organization's level, you're probably not at that stage yet because you haven't made partner. But when you do make partner, you can make waves, as you know, and I know you're very good at making waves. You can create organizations within your workplace once you have power, and they have to include men to make changes in that workplace. This is what I tell my students all the time. These are MBAs, they're about to graduate, they're all interested in what's gonna happen in their own families, and I tell them, yes, that's important, but you're gonna have real power someday. And when you do, think about the women and men, and men, because men want to be dads now. 40% of the students in my work and family class are now men. This, this is crazy. When I first started, there were no women in my class, with rare exceptions, because they didn't want to be identified with the issue of women. I taught my class to undergraduates uh, with a few women MBAs. But now, men MBAs want to be good dads. Okay, when you have power in your work organization, make changes in the culture. You know, Google has a great childcare system. Why? Because Susan Mojiski, one of the founding um, one of the founders of, of Google has four children and said to Sergey Brin, we need childcare here. And so they created a childcare center. I mean, it's had a lot of problems, but nonetheless, there's a childcare center there. Cheryl uh, Sandberg talks in her book about the fact that when she was pregnant, she realized that pregnant women needed parking near the office building. They couldn't walk uh, from, you know, seven blocks away to work. And so she got um, parking for herself and for every other woman who's pregnant. Once you have power in a work organization, you can make change. The third level is public policy. I don't hear anybody, no candidates are talking about child care. No candidates are talking about paid maternity leave, and, and let alone paternity leave. We have to change that. We have to inject that into the conversation. And even when Hillary Clinton was running for president, um, you know, she didn't talk about that. So I hope if she runs again, this time we can get to her and put some of that into the conversation. Yes. I'm a professor of economics, and uh, what we've, we've done studies on this as well. And what, what we've found is that uh, there's about as many women who enter uh, our introductory economics classes as men, but women seem to leave the major much faster once they get a, a lower grade. And so do you have any thoughts about how do we either make women less sensitive to receiving a low midterm grade and then thus leaving it, or making men more sensitive to <laughs> receiving a low grade? <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, you know, in chemistry, there's a whole movement afoot now to get more women interested in taking chemistry courses by changing the kinds of examples that are used in chemistry. Using examples that are more interesting to women. So for example, using examples from cooking. So um, I don't know why these women are more sensitive to a lower grade. That's very interesting. Um, um, I don't know, one remedy is to give them higher grades. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I don't know, we should talk afterwards. I, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Doctors are 
opportunities to have a medical career um, and not lose it. So that my comment may be something of the past. Well, medicine is interesting to me uh, because if I had had to predict in 1970 which occupations were going to be likely to create part-time jobs, I wouldn't have predicted medicine. You know, I, I, my first husband was a, uh, a physician, my second husband is a physician. I, I know a lot about physicians and training. I would never have expected that physicians would work part-time. And it's very instructive because I myself have a physician who works part-time. And I would have thought, oh, this is terrible. You know, what if I need her on Tuesday and she's not there? Well, guess what? They've figured it out. But they haven't figured it out in law and they haven't figured it out in business. And so, and, and certainly they haven't figured it out in academe. There's no way of working part-time at an institution like Stanford. Um, so um, we have to rethink this because it is a tremendous waste of resources. And I'm nervous that in the future, when graduate schools, medical schools, law schools, business schools um, have a chance to digest this, these statistics, they will say, well, do we really want to have 50% of our students who are going to drop out of, of uh, practice? Because maybe we should take more students from abroad, or maybe we should do something different. So I think that, yes, it's an individual decision, and I respect it. But as I said before, I think there are social consequences of, of those decisions. Yes? So I want to say that Stanford has a huge push on this now, on uh, women in science and engineering, both at the undergraduate level, the graduate level, and the uh, professoriate. And I'm very proud that one of my former students, Carol Muller, is heading this up. And um, you know, I, I think people are searching in every direction to figure out how to do this, including the idea <clears throat> that, for example, chemistry would have a, a modified curriculum uh, different from the one that they have now. It's clear in every field that having affinity groups, having support, having other people like you uh, to talk to, having role models is very important. So yes, and some of these groups are within <coughs> companies and some of them go across companies. Sometimes women don't want to be in groups within their own company. They'd rather talk to people in other companies. So yes, this is a big problem.